Hi everyone, and welcome to this WA Mets Digital Mining Export Hub webinar. I'm Michael Beaton, I'm the WA Export Hub Lead, and I'm pleased to host you today for um, presenting online like a pro webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we meet. For me, this is the land of the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today's session is the second web webinar of module two of our Capability Accelerator program. And we're pleased to be joined again by Dave Yates, principal at Rethink Mining. For those of you who weren't on last week's um, webinar, Dave has individually coached over 300 uh, business leaders in the med sector all over Australia. Uh, Dave's adept to how enterprise and mining engage with their future workforce, digital transformations, disruption and growth. Dave focuses on enterprise architecture, innovation and growth, stretching strategy, navigating complexity and growing processes to be more value oriented, purposeful and stable in a complex and changing world. Dave's going to take questions after, the, um, after his uh, webinar or after his session. Uh, so please feel free uh, to look in the uh, Q&A box, type your questions in the Q&A box, and uh, Dave will answer them just uh, at the end of his presentation. So uh, over to you now, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, really excited to get started. Let me jump forward one slide. So here's a bit of a rough outline of what we're going to talk about today. I've got seven different topics that we're going to cover. And all of this is really relevant to anyone who's giving any kind of presentation online. But I'm, I've given this a bit of an extra bit of thought thinking about yourselves in an export capacity and how you're potentially situated if you're pitching or engaging in sales conversations or looking to establish yourself in a new market uh, overseas. And so thinking about things like clarity, thinking about things like positioning and, and also just simple things like internet and audio can be really, really uh, important. So this will deal with some of the strategic and tactical elements of getting the message right, but also just some of the real operational stuff around how you set up or how you sound or all that kind of stuff as well. So giving yourself the opportunity to present like a pro. And hopefully you were there last week when we talk about uh, present, uh, pitching like a pro and thinking about what it is you put in the presentation. This will then say, well, how do you make that presentation and what can you do and how do you look and how do you present in order to get the right thing? So we're going to cover how you set up. We're going to cover how you sound. We're going to cover how you look. We're going to cover how you start the presentation and get up and over the hump. We're also going to start cover how you present, what you present, and then also how you wrap things up and how you finish because online is kind of weird and a bit different to offline. And so you want to make sure that it doesn't finish awkward or weird. It's just um, one of those things that can kind of taint an experience. And in particular, when it's a sales conversation or a business growth conversation, those conversations can be pretty critical and sometimes really material to the future of your business. So I want to make sure that we're giving it the time and effort and energy and focus that it deserves in each one of those areas. So let's jump in. Um, this is the world we now live in. So whether we like it or not, we're in a world where we're not just having a conversation with a screen. We're having a conversation with multiple screens and some of those screens have multiple people in them. The reason I use this photo is because it gives you a bit of context. We've got people like you and I who are single people watching a presentation. And then we've got other people who are probably on mute, who are just listening in a room full of other people. And so not only do you have the presentation and the engagement with the people on the call, but you've also got to deal with the fact that there is a room full of people who are having conversations while you're having conversations about your conversation. And likewise, the other way around, you're able to have conversations with other people in your rooms while you're listening to other people have a conversation with you. That creates a complexity and a dynamic in the context at the moment that we need to be able to address and allow for, but also in some ways leverage or fight against, mitigate, to use another word. The reason we're doing this is because if you're dealing with a room full of other people who can put themselves on mute and have a conversation, particularly in a sales environment, they can kill the deal then and there without you even being aware of it. 
right? In another, if you're introducing to a new relationship, it's really important to grab their attention and hold their attention long enough. There's a lot of distractions in another room um, or there's a lot of distractions if it's just a single head on a computer because that computer's probably got two screens and you'll, you'll very quickly see when eyeballs go from this camera here immediately to this camera here. And, you know, you can almost tell little body language signifiers of who's bought into the conversation and who's not, not by where their chin is, because it's always interesting to see who's looking at something or potentially have their camera in the wrong spot. But it's when their entire body shifts away from the camera and they're just listening out the side of their ear rather than engaged with the conversation front on. And I think that can be a really important nuance to online presenting and pitching that's really important to recognize. If you've lost someone in a pitch or a presentation and they've moved their entire body language the other way, you need to do something to win them back so that they're engaged in the conversation. Really subtle body language things, but those notes can be incredibly important in a growth business development and a sales exercise doing online presenting. So think about things like that. Recognize when you've won and lost people, when energy goes up and down and Make allowances for distractions in other rooms or distractions in your room as well and how we go about that. And that's what we're going to cover today is a little bit on how do we go about allowing for those kind of things and what are the best decisions we can make in the world of hybrid meetings and online presentations so that we get the best possible outcome or give ourselves the best chance of the best possible outcome. It's not really up to how you present. That's a component of what you've got to say. But if it was just what you've got to say and didn't include how you present, you wouldn't be having this discussion because how you present it can actually affect how people are hear and interpret what you've got to say. And that is really where I get a lot of my work done and how I do a lot of my work is because it's not just about what you have to say, it's about how they hear it and how they hear it or you are in control of to some degree and you're in control of influencing to another degree as well. So capturing attention, holding attention, and being involved in that's really, really important. So let's kick into it. How you set up. This is a really important part of the process and a really key part of, uh, of running, a, I guess, a, a good digital presentation. So let's get the fundamentals right. Number one, you need a high-speed, stable internet connection. I didn't have one of those for a good year um, after moving into a new house. And because I do a lot of these online meetings, it became net positive for me to go and get an office space, which is the one I'm in right now, because it simply was instead of being a, a, uh, a work from home solopreneur, I'm now in an office and working off of a stable high speed internet connection because these kind of presentations matter. And I needed to invest in making sure I was giving it the time and energy it required for that, uh, that kind of engagement. So a stable high speed internet connection is pretty much like a, a, an absolute must. Um, if you don't have it, or it's hard to get, think about ways in which you can go and get it. So um, I've seen people be really clever with this kind of thing. If they haven't had great internet at home or they've been in a share house and lots of people using the internet or whatever. Um, one is you can do what I did and rent an office. Number two is take a membership at a co-working space, even a casual membership where you're paying by the hour, right? Just a co-working space that's got great internet that you can work into and get things done. If you live in a regional center and it's a little bit difficult to find, then have a think about other places that might have great internet. For example, a client office. You might have a great relationship with a client and you say, listen, we really are struggling with our meetings at this particular location. Is there any chance I can sublet your meeting room every now and then for a presentation? And they may say, yes. Um, otherwise, I've seen some people do some very clever things with Qantas clubs and various other places like that as well to try and get access to the right level of, of internet. So there's always ways and there's always different uh, opportunities. Um, and these days as well, you can always tether with your phone and that's a pretty good, reliable internet connection no matter where you are as well. In addition to that, you want to think about your appropriate desk. So where are you going to sit? How are you going to sit? Are you on a sit-stand desk? Are you going to stand? Do you feel more comfortable and really what it comes down to is comfort right your presentation skills and your ability to present to others 
is largely contingent on your confidence in front of the camera. So your job will need to be, how do I get comfortable? How do I show the world that I am um, confident and able to talk? It's all about the how, how am I delivering this message? But how am I giving that air of confidence over in my work? And that really means I've got a desk in front of me that I feel confident sitting at, and there is sufficient space around me to deliver this presentation. In addition, I have this presentation that I'm giving to you right now, and I have a screen over here with all of my notes for this presentation as well. So every now and then you're going to see me look over here and draw from my notes and then address back onto the screen what I'm talking about. And that's because I've also found my, my through my experience that it's always good to have two screens. From a presentation point of view, you have the call on one and you have the presentation, then you have your notes or the PowerPoint slides or whatever else it is sitting on the other screen. And that allows you to modulate your interaction with the call very clearly. You can see what's being presented to you. And when you do, your face is looking at the camera. And when you're looking at something else, your intention is directed somewhere else. And that becomes part of the signal you're sending as a part of the presentation or the call as well. Um, again, on the computer, if we're thinking about setting up for success as well, one of the things to think about is if this is a really material call, if this is like a sales conversation with a potential client in a new space, clear the decks, nothing but the presentation open on your computer, no emails, no music playing, no other documents, like just quit everything and just have the presentation up and zoom up or whatever it is that you're using. By doing that, you limit the opportunity for the computer to crash because something in the background's run installed. You also limit the opportunity for um, malfunction of any sort or for your resources on your computer to slow and things like lag or interruption come into it as well. So you really want to stop any risk of interruption or risk of bad quality presentation. So strip the deck, make sure it's just you, your call and your presentation on your computer, and then you can kick off and get running. In addition, you want to make sure that the laptop camera is up. One of the things that what, one of the things that's happening right now is I'm speaking to you at almost eye level, right? I've got my laptop, which I use, it's a MacBook Pro, and the camera sits at the top of the screen. And that screen is, the, the whole computer is sitting on a stand that is elevated so that when I'm speaking, I'm speaking to a camera that is at as close to eye level as possible. Now that's really important because what happens is, and you've probably seen this, is people buy webcams and sit them between their two screens, but they sit on the desk height and they're looking up and everyone gets to look at everyone's nose hairs because that's obviously for whatever reason become the, the wise decision to make. It's actually really disconcerting and can come across really unprofessional to sit it up there. It's actually much easier or much better to be looking up at the camera than to be looking down at it. When you look down at the camera, you, you tuck your chin in and you speak through the bottom of your jaw. And it's very, it's, it becomes a lot more difficult to engage an audience when you're doing that. Whereas, for example, if I was to elevate this camera up above even higher or put something on a stand or even not mounted on the top of my big screen here, I would be looking up. And what happens when you look up is you actually raise your eyebrows and every speaking coach ever will tell you that when you raise your eyebrows, when you're talking to someone, you, add, you increase their attention level. I can be talking to you like this, but the second I raise my eyebrows and ask you something, people are drawn into wanting to know what's going on. So there's a whole bunch of nuance around how you set up that can elevate your presentations just by setting up properly. High-speed internet, appropriate desk, appropriate height camera, no distractions on the computer, professional surroundings, privacy so you're not interrupted by other things, cleanliness on your desktop so you're not interrupted by other programs or phone calls, everything set to do not disturb, and off you go. And that is how you get the fundamentals of a call right. In addition, we then also need to talk about how you sound. One thing that's really interesting with, uh, with online presentations, and you'll even find this with things like YouTube videos or podcasts, is when you do the work, and almost any producer will tell you this, when you do the work, it's weighted almost 30, 70, or even 80, 20 towards sound. You can have a terrible video and fantastic sound and get away with it. 
But if you have a fantastic piece of video and terrible sound, you almost don't want to watch. How you sound has an enormous impact on how people hear you. So finding a good microphone that can actually grab the lower resonance of your voice, particularly if you're selling, and I mean this for women and men, if you're in a selling position and you need to assert some uh, negotiating power or some authority in the conversation, being able to use a microphone that can pick up the lower resonance of your voice so that you can assert yourself a little bit and be able to be confident in your presentation can make an enormous difference. It seems so subtle and so nuanced, but all of this stuff is so subtle. These are what we call the one percenters. You put 20, 30 of these kind of one percenters together and people wonder why your presentations are so much better than everyone else's. It's not really one thing, it's all of them mixed together. So getting a microphone and good acoustic control. This room for me is okay. I can get away with it at the moment, but if I was to do anything, and it's probably a project I'll do in the next few months, is probably, probably put some acoustic paneling on the wall because I do get a little bit of echo in this room and it's something that I'd love to try and repair or fix as well. What do I use? I've got a Rode NT USB microphone. So this is a Rode product. Um, you don't have to use this one. Obviously, I'm not trying to promote this particular product. There's ones like Snowballs and a whole bunch of podcasting gear out there that's relatively affordable as well. The job is to find something that can sit on your desk or sit on an arm that can come across and plug into your computer. The reason I love this one is because it actually doesn't have a microphone jack. It goes straight into your, a USB port. So it's called a Rode NT-USB. It goes straight into the USB port of your computer, recognized by things like Zoom as a microphone and away you go. There's really not much setup to it. And the increase on your resonant frequency within your voice is less canned than that you would get within a computer as well. Um, you want to be careful with things like Bluetooth headphones because even things like Apple AirPods, as much as they're good and they kind of wireless and they get out of the way, what can happen is people put them in and for whatever reason, it it comes across like you're talking to someone on a hands-free kit in a car, really crackly, really Bluetoothy, and really sharp and nasally. And it's not really the kind of presence that you want to have on a phone call with someone that you're trying to convince or sell. So the job is to move that in a totally different direction and actually capture that sound. So finding a microphone, this one's got a stand, I've got other microphones in here on booms as well, and you can use different ones for different purposes, but really thinking about, okay, what does that look like as well? Um, and then test that mic before the call. So making sure that you're using the right mic and making a big difference and, and seeing how it's going to make a big difference uh, in your call, playing back that sound, making sure you feel like you sound right um, or that it's close enough or far enough away to capture your sound appropriately and that you've done the testing work and you've got confidence in the tech as well. You don't want to just run out and grab a new mic and then plug it in and hope it works. The moment of truth in your business, I think you want to do the testing work appropriately. Um, and yeah, and so as far as what else I use, I'm like taking a small office inside a co-working space. It's not breaking the bank at the moment, but it gives me the privacy to do these kind of presentations and the acoustic control I need to be able to do these presentations as well. I don't have kids in school holidays running past the door. And I also don't have um, a co-working space that's open that people have to listen to these kind of conversations all the time. So things like that can be really important as well. The next one is how you look. Now, this is going to sound ridiculous, but wear a collar. The reason I say wear a collar is because when you're giving a presentation and you're just wearing a T-shirt, all of a sudden everything flattens out on the image, right? And it just looks like, remember, you've only really got from your chest up to give a presentation. So thinking about the, the, the shaping of your face against your fashion can be really important. You're establishing a brand potentially for the first time in a new market. So give it the time it deserves. Recognize the culture you're integrating with as well and present with the right brand for your business now 
even some of you might turn around and say, well, we wear polos or we wear T-shirts or whatever. I would say even with the polo, where you know, they've got a collar, that's fine. Think about the way it shapes your neck so that it doesn't feel like there's this hovering moon of a face sitting in the middle of the, of the presentation, but you're actually a whole person and you're presented. I'd probably say one of the things, and I haven't got it in the be careful here, but one of the things to think about is um, those, head, those canned headphones with a big microphone. I use them for um, calls in other spaces when I don't have the privacy like I do in this one. But if you've got the ability to not have that and you can just have a conversation like I am now, it actually feels a lot more human and you don't feel so tucked in. What I find is when people put on their headphones, they also lean forward and it becomes a very closed off experience with that individual. You want it to be open, you want it to be light, you want it to be free, and you want that to be that openness to influence an open discussion about you know, contract terms or potential relationship or whatever it might be as well. Use reminders. The guys at Ostmine do a great job with made backgrounds, image backgrounds in their work. I've got a TV in my office, so I put my logo up on the screen. I've got a couple of logos depending on what kind of call I'm having. And so I'll use that as a, as a flexible piece in terms of my presentations as well. Um, and then also thinking about, okay, what else do I do in terms of lighting as well? So I'm in a fortunate position of having a window right next to me. I get a good deal of natural light and a, and a well-lit office. Um, if I didn't have that, I'd probably be looking at some kind of stationary um, lights to light up my face for these kind of presentations as well. Um, and recognize that if you don't have that, or if I was to switch off the light and this light was lighting me from back and I was relying on just the light coming through from the computer, you end up looking like a bit of a ghost as well. So bad lighting can really go poorly for you, particularly if you're in a presentational sales scenario. So be aware of what you're doing there. And then, and then the last piece is also wear pants. Um, I've got this photo here of this guy not wearing pants or wearing pajamas below his uh, his business attire. And whilst it seems asinine and a bit funny or silly to say it, you never know when you're going to have to get up. The door might unexpectedly knock or you might think, oh, I've got to grab that book. I've got to show you. And you get up only to reveal accidentally your Mickey Mouse um pajamas or whatever else you're, you're wearing underneath your board. I did some work with a, um, a startup out of Newcastle who was, you know, coming to work, putting on a shirt, but still wearing the, the morning surfing board shorts underneath, you know, think about giving the presentation, the time and the, the, the honor it deserves based on your opportunity as a business and, and do the right thing in that space as well. So minimize distractions, maximize engagement with what you have to say by managing how you look in a meaningful way. Next piece is then how do you start? So how do you grab the room's attention and hold it over the hump? What we've found with these kind of presentations is people will be in and as soon as you kind of get started, give it three, four minutes, people go, all right, what else have I got on? And they'll move over to their other screen and they'll start reading emails, they'll hit mute and they'll start talking across the, the, the room. The job is to not let them do that for as long as possible. Because if you can hold that tension for as long as possible and get over the hump, they'll actually end the call leaning into the conversation and, and have brought themselves on that journey, listening actively the whole way through. Well, what, what do you need to do? The first thing you need to do is introduce the context. So you need to think about what is it that, why are we here? Who brought you here? And what are we going to do to talk about this? So context is king. Why are we here? What are we looking to achieve? What got us here in the first place? Who got us here? Um, it's a great opportunity to open with gratefulness. I'm really thankful that so-and-so has connected us to you. I feel like we're going to be, um, this is going to be a really fruitful meeting. I've got an opportunity to put in front of you that would be worth talking about, et cetera, et cetera. First, let me get started by introducing who else is on the call. And you can go through the people that are on the call. Again, this is something people won't dive away from because they want to know who's who in the zoo and who you brought with you to the conversation and they want might want to do the same. Everyone loves getting their time with the microphone. So people are going to want to know what are they going to be expected to say and how do they not look silly in an environment like that as well. Great way to hold the room's attention and get it over the hump. Then you can also orient yourself around outlining the purpose and the intent. So we're here today to discuss and really honing in on what that might be. 
And then much like we talked about last week with the, the pitching for success is looking at, well, how do I weave in a story here as well? So maybe it's that why moment when we finally go from what and how into the why this matters for us and potentially telling a story and holding their attention all the way to that point will hopefully peg their attention on this call and they won't need to move off anywhere else. And that allows you to also not jump into the, the meat and the sandwich too quickly but give the people listening on the call the chance to digest a little bit and to slow down and take on the information you're, you're focused on. It also gives you the opportunity to connect it with purpose and bring case studies or examples, or stories into it to help them make meaning out of it. It's all well and good to have a product to sell or have an opportunity that, they, that you think they would like. The job is to not convince them that you're right the job is to understand what would make them feel like they're right in choosing you. And that's a totally different game that requires some of that nuanced salesmanship, managing how you sound, managing how you set up and making sure you're aware of who's in the room along the way as well. That's a little bit about how you start, start how you grab the room's attention and how you hold it over the hump as well. And then we get into the presentation. So the key piece here is actually people rarely remember anything that you say. They will remember how you made them feel. So the job here is to not turn into a boring drone who simply sits there and reads 16 bullet points per slide. The job is to be captivating and different and interesting and someone that they want to sit there and listen to in more detail. So take the opportunity and, and talk with your hands. Um, move that Zoom call under your camera. What I mean by that is what I've done with this call is I have a view of people's cameras and what I can see, and I'm situating that window quite literally underneath my camera so that every time I'm talking, I'm talking to faces on the call and I'm looking at the camera at the same time. My conversation happens right here and everything else everywhere else is simply a distraction or an in piece of information that can feed back to this conversation. My attention constantly comes back to the center and that center is situated exactly where the recipients of this call are, which is right at the camera. So we want to make sure that that Zoom call is tucked up under or at least taking up the whole screen of the screen with the camera on it. If you have a camera mounted on top of your screen, then situate the, the Zoom call as close to that camera as possible. And then talk to your audience, not the slides. So you don't sit me over here talking to these slides and these notes that I've got over here. You hear me talking over here. And when I need to make reference, I go over there. So you're always talking to your audience and not to your slides so that people can engage. Because some people will want to read the slides, but some people are watching body language, particularly in a sales environment, and just seeing how confident you really are with your bits. Now, the last the other piece here is also talking about it from, from the point of view of pace. So we want to avoid moving too fast. Now, this is the lunchtime session, so I'm aware that I'm moving pretty fast through this particular piece, but part of that's also feeding an enormous amount of content into a small amount of time and trying to benefit you guys. So feel free to send me an email or get in touch. I'm more than happy to work with you on what that looks like for you going forward. But um, we do need to be aware of how to talk and where to keep the pace and where to slow down where we're getting too fast and really recognize the value of speed and tone in this as well. You'll notice when I talk, I go from speaking really, really fast about all sorts of different things to slowing right down and making my points very clearly about the things that matter. It's just simply modulating your own tone and your own speed so that people understand which bits are important and which bits we can move through with relative speed or relative pace. So speed up when it's not important or when it's less important or where it's just information. And then when it's an ask or whether it's a statement or whether it's something you want them to buy into, you want to slow down and make your point. And that allows you to then engage with the conversation in a more meaningful way. They recognize what bits are important to you and can then follow up with questions or associated references from there as well. And that allows you also to not sound monotonous. So you can vary the tone and you don't always sound like this 
which ends up sounding like a robot because you don't really change any kind of pace or tone at all. And people end up zoning out because you end up sounding like a metronome. You don't want that. What you want is to be able to lift up and then come down and lean in and lean out and slow right down and then speed right back up again and give yourself the opportunity to modulate and gain engagement by simply presenting really, really strongly from that point of view. The other thing is, and I'm fortunate in this office space to have a really deep desk and so I can kick back from the computer. I'm not right up here in the computer and everyone's looking at my nose hairs. I'm kicked back from the desk a little bit. I'm able to spread my arms, share, move, talk with my hands a little bit and give the position needed to present well, basically. And that gives a really strong sense of confidence, particularly when you're trying to get confidence across on an online presentation. That can be quite difficult. So giving yourself the space to use your body language, even though you're online, can be really impactful in those kind of conversations as well. In terms of what you present, the challenge here is actually about maximizing the amount of words not said. I'll say that again. In terms of presentation, what you're looking to do is maximize the amount of words not said. Another way to think about this is to actually say, how am I going to make sure they ask questions? What am I not going to say, even though I could say it, even though it's there to be said, and even though I've got an answer, what am I not going to say so that they're left wanting more? It's a really simple tactic, but it can make all the difference because what you end up with is an audience on tender hooks who have questions. And that's good because now you have engagement and they will ask you questions that are pertinent to the deal. And if the job is to get the deal done, then you want them to be having the conversation with you that they want to have. And then they're leading the conversation, which means they're leading the buying, which means you're all of a sudden not selling, you're helping. And that's the kind of environment you want to be in. So when you present, you want to maximize the amount of words not said and be careful of too much information. I mean, if you really need to get it across, sure. Put it in an appendix, reference the appendix at the end of your presentation, showcase maybe even just a quick scroll through here's all the other things we've got to share but there wasn't enough time in today's presentation more than happy to take you through it in detail should you want to otherwise it'll be attached to the pack when we send it through as a pdf simple ways to just get through the hump and give them the information to digest on their own time the other thing to think about is what do you do after the presentation so design the presentation with a view for next steps so that it's not just a presentation in isolation and they get to the end and they have to say yes or no. Think about, okay, well, what is the ask at the end of the presentation and how would that follow-up look like? Maybe you don't give them a yes, no answer, but an A, B answer. The following conversation will go into a bit more detail, but we want to make sure the right people are on the call for that. So before we have that conversation, have a chat with your own team, work out who needs to be on that next thing, and then come back to us and let us know. We're happy to either come to you and have that conversation or we can have another online meeting. And that way they're choosing, do we want to have it online or do we want to have it in person? And that accelerates the buying game as well. So that simple stuff like that can make all the difference in terms of what you present and the penetration you get with your audience when you're talking about that kind of thing. Think about it in terms of simple bullet points. These presentation slides I'm using today are about as complex as I would expect. Anything more than this is too much on a slide. And you go, Dave, but I've got whole schematic drawings. I've got evidence. I've got case studies. I've got all sorts of really wild and amazing information that would be worth sharing. The answer is great. Put it into a case study and send it to them to read. You don't need to present it. The job is to present them with the least amount of words so that you're in control of the conversation and it's a conversation, not a presentation. Because if you can make it a conversation, people can ask questions, they feel free to, you're starting at the right level and you're deep diving based on their needs. You're not trying to deep dive into areas that they don't really have a need for. Because if you go down that road, you'll end up boring certain people on the call to tears, they'll disengage, their whole body language will shift away from the call and you will have lost them. The job is to get the right people in the room to buy into another conversation by limiting the amount of things you have to say and maximizing the amount of words not said while still saying all the bits that are important. 
I know that sounds paradoxical, but it's really important to get right. So that's the kind of thing that I can help with. Should you need some coaching, we can talk about that at the end as well. Um, pictures on every page. I mean, it sounds so simple. It's almost high school, but really I see far too much of it. If you have a presentation with a bunch of bullet points on it, make sure you can fit a picture in. Some people read through words. Some people through understand through body language. Other people think in pictures, myself included. If you don't put a picture on the page, you might be missing one or two people off your call. And those two people might be decision makers. So give yourself the opportunity to connect with them as well and put a picture on the page. Whether that's a diagram or a model or something else and photo of a client, whatever it is, it reinforces the, the, the presentation you're trying to make or the point you're trying to make in a way that speaks to that individual. Um, tables and graphs are another one, good way to look at it, but let me be very clear because even last week I saw someone put an entire spreadsheet as a screenshot on a PowerPoint presentation. If I can't read it from the back of the room, I just won't read it. It's as simple as that. Put it in a case study in detail in a Word document as a PDF that I can read. Otherwise, show me the trend on a graph without me needing to read the graph. Does that make sense? So moving from um, a detailed graph or table that shows all the details to here's a detailed graph of all the details. You don't need to read them. What you need to see is this trend from A to B moves in a positive direction. And this is what we want to show you. This is the part that makes sense to you. So get to the, get to the, the point by speaking about details in abstraction. Set it up so that you're a little bit further away and you're seeing it from a further away vantage point and presenting in a way that maximizes the amount of words or the amount of detail not said. And then there's how you finish. So once you've gone through and set up properly and looked at how you sound and how you look and started well and presented clearly and presented something of value and come up with a good set of next steps, what you really want to do is synthesize the whole presentation back to them, just like I did with you then. Summarize what you've presented so that your audience understands what to do next. So synthesize everything down to a simple action. And that summary should transition to the, to the ask. So if you're in a business development call, if you're in a strategic partnership call, it's at this point you should say, right, now that we've taken you through all the different pieces, what we would really like to ask of you is this. We want a trial, we want two weeks at site, we want to engage you on a strategic partnership, we want to do a pilot test with you, um, we'd like to acquire some of your data so we can run tests for the first time. Whatever it might look like, this is the bit to transition to that ask and you're giving enough time and space and even just slides on the screen to move towards that conversation. That way it finishes clearly it looks planned, not accidental. And your audience is fully aware of what those next steps look like. So you're finishing clearly, you're avoiding those awkward endings and you're getting to that ask as easily as possible. So in this, <clears throat> in this particular case, it would be something like, we've talked about how you're gonna set up in an environment where most people are either sitting by themselves in a room listening to you or sitting in a room with others talking to each other about your presentation. We need to think about how we sound. We need to think about how we look. We need to make sure our computers are elevated enough so that we're talking to the audience eye to eye, that we're presenting with a nice personal brand and a good sound capture device that captures our audio really strongly. And then we wanna look at starting well, being captivating, telling stories, using case studies, presenting by talking with our hands, presenting good content that moves towards the next step and doesn't provide too much information, but abstracts everything really, really clearly and nicely. And from there, you can transition into the next step. And if that's something that you feel like, whoa, Dave, that is so much different than what I'm currently doing and I don't even know where to start, then that's part of what Osman and I are here for is to help. And so if, you're not, if you would like some of that help and you'd like me to spend some time with you, that coaching is available and we'll get into that a little bit after this call. But that's the ask. It's as simple as that. You may actually find that by doing it this way, your move towards a sales conversation is way less awkward and much faster. 
the the ask is much briefer because you've given it all the context it deserves to get to the ask in the first place. So you want to synthesize everything down to that simple action. That simple action is then easy to action on behalf of the client so that they know what the next step looks like. And you're giving them a reason to engage with those next steps as well. So in summary, you want to set up with cam camera elevation. You want to know your microphone and how you sound with it. You want to set up how you look with lighting, lighting, lighting. You want to manage your start and get energy over the hump. You want to present by keeping pace, varying the tone. You want to present by keeping simple as well. And then you want to finish well by summarizing just as I'm doing here and then moving towards the ask as well. And with that, it kind of comes to the end of this presentation. Questions from the floor. And I think there's a Q&A box at the bottom of this Zoom call. So I might throw to the audience and then back to uh, Michael or Jolene from this point and just see if there's any questions from the audience before we go much further. I haven't seen any questions come through just yet. Feel free to use either the chat or the Q&A box along the bottom. And we can answer any questions you might have off the back of that call. Um, and maybe while we wait for those questions to come through, Michael, do you want to just take us through next steps? Sure, Dave. Um, thanks for your presentation today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your expertise and time. Um, as we, as I said at the beginning, this is the uh, final uh, webinar in our Module 2 of Capability Accelerator Program. Um, but as Dave highlighted, you know, you've still got access to Dave after this um, call. Uh, just feel free to reach out to Jolene that you're interested in getting free one-on-one -on -one mentoring with Dave and you'd be you're more than happy to help and um, build on um, what he's discussed today and also last week. So, uh, look, I encourage you all to, um, you know, send an email out to Jolene and get in contact with Dave. Um, we're going to have a couple of weeks break now as far as uh, getting into the next module. This will be module three of our Marketing Masterclass series with Collins Rex. Uh, we kick off that on the 11th of October, um, then 18th and 25th, as it's set in the screen. Um, please feel free to register um, on our website. Um, we'll also send you the presentation later with the links. Uh, but yeah, feel free to register for those three. That should be a great um, module as well as uh, like we've had with Dave. Um, the next part, a bit of promotion within the hub. Um, we've got an international market development program. Uh, we've got Indonesia and Papua New Guinea up, up at the moment. And due to some um, strong member interest and outside stakeholder interest, we're also developing a uh, market development program in India. So again, please contact Jolene with your interest if you're interested in exporting your product or service into India, even PNG in Indonesia, you can still access those programs as well. Uh, finally, uh, with Ostmine, um, IMARC coming up in November, this time it's up in Sydney. So um, please feel free to go to the Ostmine website or um, the website that you see on the screen and register your interest uh, to going there. It's a preeminent uh, conference uh, in the mining and resources. Uh, sector. And next year we have Osmine 23, that's now Adelaide, uh, part of uh, transforming our future, um, and certainly building a lot of momentum as far as um, uh, the panel, the uh, program and uh, the people that will be presenting. Um, please feel free to go to the dedicated Osmine conference website or go to the Osmine website and follow the links from there. Uh, just before I finish on this one, Dave, I think there's something that came through on the Q&A. There is, yeah. So the question was, is it okay to use background options from Teams and Zoom? To, the short answer to that is yes, but if you're in a professional environment, I would be doing exactly what Michael's got behind him, is take the opportunity to use the background environment and don't do some tropical beach somewhere or some fake office. Do something that represents your business. 
and use the opportunity to drive home the representation that you present on the call. Um, I'd also say if you're going to do that and you're going to use an image background, be aware of lighting. Zooms and Zoom and Teams both use artificial intelligence to create a mask around your body so that they can then mask you out because you don't have a green screen or anything behind you. So it is a little difficult to do that. So be aware of foreground and background and lighting and make sure that the foreground is well lit and the background is not well lit so that the AI can do a good job of tracing you and you don't end up with weird and wonderful masking errors as you go around that. Particularly people who have frizzy hair, that can be quite difficult for the computer to keep up with. So recognizing as well, even just hair and your hairstyle can make a difference to that kind of thing. If you do have hair and you like to wear it out, um, maybe tying it back for the call if you're wanting to use a, a background and things like that as well. So. The answer is yes, I would use them. I'd use them professionally and I either go to a designer or use something like Canva to pull together what that, that looks like. You can then upload it to Zoom or Teams and have a custom background that can be done relatively easily. Um, there's plenty of online help for that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use it, just use it well and use it professionally. I think that was it from a questions point of view, Michael. Um, might give it a couple more seconds just in case anyone else has got questions. Um, and then, uh, yeah, go from there. Doesn't look like anything new is coming through. Sure. Um, okay. So, Dave, thank oh, you very much for your go. time. Oh, Apologies. Everyone. One more. <laughs> What's your thoughts on cor playing corporate videos during a virtual meeting? So this changed during the pandemic. Two years ago, I would have said, terrible, don't do it, doesn't work, right? What has happened is Zoom and Teams have created an option in their menu called Share System Audio. And the Share System Audio option allows you to pipe through the audio of a video to the other people without them hearing a feedback loop through your speakers. So that can be incredibly useful if you would like to do, play a corporate video. It still is a bit clunky and depending on your internet can be a bit jittery. So I wouldn't necessarily overdo it. To be honest, in an environment like, um, in the environment like we're in today, you're probably better suited to make that kind of investment on your website and make sure that you can send people to be sitting there perusing your content with absolute focus and contextual conversation as you'll ever get um, while having a conversation with you. That way they're giving, you're giving them an opportunity to read something on your website and feedback or potentially watch a video on your website on their own internet connection in their own time while on mute, that would probably do a relatively good job as well. So putting those corporate videos on your website, on your YouTube channel, allowing people to read or listen or watch those sorts of things in meaningful ways. That's not to say if you've got a really good explainer video that does a good job of getting the complex across quickly, by all means do it, but practice with some friends first, that shared system audio feature um, in both Teams and Zoom uh, that you might want to use. And then from there, yeah, you can use it. Absolutely. Fabulous. Thanks, no Michael. last questions? No, I think we're clear. <laughs> Done. Uh, look, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, I hope you got a lot out of it. Again, feel free to reach out to Dave. Uh, Dave, thank you for your time over the last, uh, you know, two webinars and, you know, holding uh, this module uh, two into some really um, interesting insights into pitching, presenting, and um, certainly something for us all to build on. Um, as I said, uh, Tuesday the 11th of October is the next time we start with module three. Please feel free to register, but until then, um, have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.